Hello and welcome. You're watching Gravitas with me, Molly Gambhir. Here's a quick look at what's lined up for you on the show tonight. For over a year now, the one question that has dominated global discussions is when will the Russia-Ukraine war end? And then came another big question, who is winning? All this as the threat of the war turning nuclear continued to loom over Europe. It has been a tense few months to say the least and developments over the last 24 hours have given birth to yet another question. Russia says it would be stationing some of its nuclear weapons in Belarus. So is Europe on the brink of a nuclear war? Is the threat of a nuclear war increasingly real? What's really going on behind the scenes? Who is to be blamed for this latest escalation in the tensions? We get you all this and more in our cover story tonight. Also on the show for you tonight, amid growing unrest over Netanyahu's judicial overhaul, is he going to choose to save himself and destroy the government? What's in store for the people of Israel? After Air India and Nepal Airlines pla planes almost collided, we decode the recent incidents in Nepal and look at the bigger picture. Is Nepal the world's most dangerous fly zone? Are aliens watching you? Well, a draft Pentagon report suggests aliens may be visiting our solar system and releasing tiny probes quite similar to the missions undertaken by NASA. Have you been having a hard time dealing with those Monday blues and Sunday scaries on the eve of a work week? Well, you could try bare minimum Mondays. What are they? Do they work? We tell you. Europe has been the central battlefield in two horrific, savage world wars and a cold war bris bristling with nuclear tension. It is facing a nuclear trigger once again. And why do I say that? Listen to this before I tell you more. Alexander Lukashenko has been bringing up the question of deploying Russian tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus for a long time. So we agreed that we will do the same without violating our obligations. I emphasize without violating our international obligations on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. That is Russia saying that it would be stationing some of its nuclear weapons in Belarus. Not all, but definitely some of them. He said, listen, we are your closest allies. Why do the Americans deploy at their allies, on their territory, train the crews, the pilots, so how to use this type of weapon if needed? You see, Russia's logic is simple. If the United States can do it, so can Russia. But why exactly now? The Ukraine war, yes, but more specifically, the West's latest move in this war. I'm talking about Britain's decision to send shells made of depleted uranium to Ukraine. What is depleted uranium, you ask? It's a byproduct that is created during uranium enrichment process. It's aimed at generating nuclear fuel and weapons. It is basically a leftover 
Britain's decision to send this leftover led to Russian commentators speculating about a possible nuclear strike. One thing led to another, and before anyone realized, Russia was announcing nuclear deployment in Belarus. We have already helped our Belarusian colleagues to modify the aircraft, the aircraft of the Air Force. Ten of the aircraft are ready to use this type of weapon. We have already transferred to Belarus our well-known, very effective complex Iskander. It can be a delivery vehicle as well. On the 3rd of April, we will start training the crews. Russia's plan is to essentially start training Belarusian air crew as early as April. That is less than seven days from now. Belarusian pilots will be trained in maneuvering aircraft carrying nuclear bombs. Russia will be building a storage facility in Belarus for the nuclear weapons. If you watch this show regularly, then you already know that Russia has the world's biggest stockpile of nuclear warheads. We are looking at some 5,977 warheads. And estimates say around 1,500 of these warheads are retired. A little over 2,800 are in reserve. And some 1,500 are deployed in strategic locations. And where exactly are these strategic locations? It's hard to point that out on a map. What we do know, though, courtesy America's Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, is that Russia has deployed some 812 of its nuclear weapons on land-based ballistic missiles. Around 576 of the nuclear weapons are deployed on submarines. 300 are in heavy bomber bases. And where exactly are these submarines or bases? Unless you are a part of the team in charge of Russia's nuclear weapons, you will not know this. What we can still tell you, though, is that if everything goes according to Vladimir Putin's plan, Russian nukes could be in Belarus as early as July. Ukraine's Secretary of National Security and Defense Council, Oleksiy Danilov, put out this tweet. He claims Belarus has been taken a nuclear hostage. But you know what? Belarusian law actually has provisions allowing Russian nukes to be stored in the country. In fact, the referendum to this end was only held last year following the invasion of Ukraine. In short, the country here, or at least its leader, is not complaining. So much so that after Putin made the big nuclear announcement, Belarus released a video showing off its military capability. This war is clearly expanding and much like a whirlpool, it is drawing in more players. Today, Europe seems to be one diplomatic or strategic misfire away from a nuclear war. And whom do you blame? It's a tit for tat logic that Putin is offering you. NATO says Putin's moves are dangerous, irresponsible. But the fact is the Russian president is not completely wrong. He is not lying about America's nuclear deployment. The fact is, America does have a nuclear weapon sharing agreement with five countries. Which countries are these? Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Italy and Turkey. And are we to assume that all of these countries host American nukes? Well, the answer to that question would be yes. America stores its B-61 gravity bombs in these countries. The explosive force of these bombs goes from 0 0.3 to 170 kilotons. And just to give you a point of reference here, the bomb dropped in Hiroshima had around 0 0.3 kilotons of explosive force. 
So American bombs that are over 100 times deadlier are deployed in these countries. And how many bombs are we talking about? This is the breakdown according to the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. It claims that Turkey has 50 American nuclear weapons, Italy has 40, Belgium 20, Germany 20, and the Netherlands 20. And to top that, you have France, a NATO member that has its own nuclear weapons, 290 of them. And where exactly are these weapons located? Let me just read out for you what the Center for Arms Control and Non-Proliferation states. The United States and its NATO allies do not disclose exact figures for its European deployed stockpiles. In 2021, it is estimated that there are 100 US-owned nuclear weapons stored in five NATO member states across six bases. The weapons are not armed or deployed on aircraft. They are instead kept in underground vaults in national air bases and the permissive action link codes used to arm them remain in American hands. So this is the bigger picture here. Some 6,000 odd nuclear weapons, active, reserve and retired in Russia and around 440 NATO nukes stationed in Europe face to face with Russia and just one strategic misfire away from blasting off. And from a continent on the brink of a nuclear war, we turn to a country on the brink of a civil war. I'm talking about Israel. The promised land is in the grip of turmoil, the likes of which it has never seen. Have a look at these images. This is Tel Aviv's main highway. Last night, it resembled a war zone. Israelis armed with flags and slogans blocked it for several hours at a stretch. So you think that's bad? Then you have a look at these images. They are from another part of the city they show the protesters as far as the eye can see and right in the middle is a banner of Benjamin Netanyahu that is set ablaze with a flamethrower. And in Jerusalem, it was the same story. On Sunday night, protesters gathered outside the president's residence. They were waving Israeli flags and chanting democracy. And these, by the way, are not the only two cities protesting. Have a look at this map. As I speak, every major Israeli city is in the grip of turmoil. Haifa, Netanya, Ashdod, Beersheva, Akri, Holon, besides several others. The question is, why are the Israelis protesting? Well, we have been telling you this for weeks now. It's because of a proposed judicial reform that will curtail the powers of the judiciary. And the protests against the move have been on for quite some time. But you see, over the weekend, they escalated due to the sacking of Israel's defense minister. You heard that right, the sacking of the defense minister, Yoav Gallant. The 64-year-old has been fired from his post because he spoke out against Netanyahu's plan. He said the planned judicial reform is creating a rift in the Israeli society. You have to listen to this. The events taking place and the issues in Israeli society do not skip the Israeli Defense Forces. Unprecedented feelings of anger, pain and disappointment have risen. And I see the source of our strength eroding. 
As Minister of Defense of the State of Israel, I emphasize the growing rift in our society is penetrating the IDF and security agencies. This poses a clear, immediate and tangible threat to the security of the state. I will not allow this. You heard that. I will not allow this. Well, Netanyahu has given him the same message that he will not allow the defense minister to criticize his plan while staying in office. And so he removed him, told him that he no longer has faith in him. And the fallout has been disastrous. It has been met with disdain, not just by people within Israel, but also by Israelis living abroad. Have a look at this headline. On Sunday, Israel's Consul General in New York announced his resignation. His name is Asaf Zamir. He says he can no longer represent the government and is returning to Israel to join the protests. And it doesn't end there. According to reports, the Israeli embassy in New Delhi is also participating in this protest. In fact, the staff at all Israeli missions in India will apparently be on strike until the proposal is scrapped. Back in Tel Aviv, Israel's major trade unions in the private sector are threatening to launch a general strike if Netanyahu does not scrap his proposal. The new union's head saying that this strike will not just impact businesses but also halt all operations at the Ben Gurion International Airport. Listen to this. We are going from here to a general strike in the economy. All of us, employers and employees across all the states of Israel, are stopping the judiciary revolution and the madness. In fact, the protests have reached the parliament as well. Earlier, too, Israeli lawmakers tried disrupting a vote on a key bill. Some ye yelled shame against the government. Others were escorted out of the hall. The opposition leader, Yair Lapid, said the demonstrations were proof that the current government has become too dangerous for the state of Israel. Too dangerous. Listen to this. What happened during the past 24 hours is madness. It is a loss of senses and loss of track. It is proof that this government has lost the brakes. It is dangerous for the state of Israel. It endangers Israel's security and our home is in danger. So you have citizens, the opposition, the ministers, the diplomats. They are all protesting against Netanyahu's plan. So this, of course, begs the question, what will Benjamin Netanyahu do? Will he save himself or destroy his government? And right now, there is no easy answer to this question. Reports say Netanyahu is for a change considering halting the judicial overhaul. He is apparently conducting legal decisions and could announce his decision by tomorrow. But some of his ministers don't want him to do this. Like Yariv Levin, the Justice Minister of Israel. He says he will resign if Netanyahu scraps the plan. And he, by the way, is not alone in saying so. Some ultra-Orthodox leaders are threatening to do something similar. So Netanyahu is caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. If he refuses to scrap the overhaul, Israel will slip further into anarchy. And if he decides to scrap the overhaul, his own coalition will fall apart and ultimately lead to another election. It is a tough choice that he faces, a choice that he will have to make in the next 24 hours. Shifting focus for now, India hosted a confidential G20 meeting on Saturday. Around 100 international delegates arrived. But an important G20 member was missing. I'm talking about China. Beijing has not commented on the reason of its absence, but we cannot ignore the elephant in the room. The meeting was held in Arunachal Pradesh. 
the Indian state that China claims as its own territory. You see, China is still delusional over Arunachal Pradesh. It does not recognize India's sovereignty over the state and it has time and again tried to breach the line of actual control. Have a look at this headline. Only three months back, on the 9th of December, the People's Liberation Army tried to unilaterally change the status quo. Around 300 to 400 PLA soldiers launched an attack in Tawang sector. They came equipped with spike clubs, taser guns. They were confronted by Indian soldiers. Troops from both sides sustained injuries. The matter was later resolved in a flag meeting. And in the days leading up to the clash, China increased its air activities on its side of the LEC. Chinese drones flew close to the area. The Indian Air Force also stepped up its surveillance. And the face-off wasn't a first and likely will not be the last. The PLA has been uh, upping its activity. Troops have damaged unoccupied bunkers and other infrastructure. They have been laying hands on civilians as well. Have a look at this report. A 17-year-old was abducted by the PLA. He was assaulted and given electric shocks in captivity. He was finally handed over to the Indian Army after a week of high-level diplomatic talks between the two countries. It's almost like China has been seeking trouble. It has been laying false claims on the whole of Arunachal Pradesh. Chinese maps show Arunachal Pradesh as part of China. Have a look at this report by China's state-run media outlet. In 2021, China's Ministry of Civil Affairs renamed 15 places in the state and this included eight residential areas, four mountains, two rivers and a mountain pass. It was the second batch of so-called standardized names. The first one came out in 2017, which renamed six places in Arunachal and this triggered a sharp response from India. The Ministry of External Affairs said that invented names cannot alter the facts on the ground. China is also trying to control rivers and weaponize water. Have a look at these satellite images. They show China is building a dam along India's border on a tributary of the river Ganga. The Chinese call it the Yarlong Zangbo River. It flows into Arunachal Pradesh as the Siang and then to Assam as the Brahmaputra River. China can use this dam to store water, causing shortages in Assam and Arunachal Pradesh. Beijing has also routinely objected to visits by the Dalai Lama and Indian leaders to Arunachal Pradesh. And now it decided to sit out of that G20 meeting in the same state. And it doesn't take a genius to connect those dots. On the one hand, China is trying to play a global peacemaker. Remember, it brokered a peace agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. It's also trying to mediate as far as the Russia-Ukraine war is concerned. But on the other hand, it is playing petty politics with India. Why else would it skip the meeting? What does it have to say for its absence? Is Nepal the most dangerous fly zone in the world? I ask this because of something that happened on the 24th of March. A Nepal airline plane almost hit an Air India flight. Even in the era of top-notch technology, traffic alert and collision avoidance systems, Nepal managed to risk a near collision in its airspace. How does that even happen? Well, here's what happened. An Air India flight was en route Kathmandu from Delhi. The flight had entered Kathmandu's airspace and was descending. The pilot asked Kathmandu's ATC or the air traffic control if it can descend from 19,000 feet to 15,000 feet. And reports say the ATC gave a go ahead. But what the air traffic controller did not tell the Air India plane was that another flight was also descending to land at the same time. And this one was a Nepal Airlines flight. It was flying into Kathmandu from Kuala Lumpur. 
The Times of India quotes a source as saying Air India crews saw the flight coming from the other direction and immediately informed Kathmandu Air Traffic Control. The ATC asked Air India crew to ascend sharply to avoid a collision, which they did, and a tragedy was averted. But what if it had not been averted? What if the crew had not spotted the other plane? There were some 200 odd people on board, on board both the planes. And it was the job of Kathmandu's air traffic controllers to ensure that both the planes and all the planes that come into the city land safely. But clearly, Kathmandu's controllers have no control of what's happening in their skies. They let two planes come too close, almost hit each other. Nepal's Aviation Authority says the air traffic controllers responsible have been suspended. But to what end? Because this is a recurring story. Nepal's civil aviation is a horror story. You see, there have been 42 fatal plane crashes in Nepal in the last 77 years. Sometimes the country blames the topography, sometimes it's the poor weather, and sometimes it is cockpit communication or pilot error. But the problem here is actually none of the above. Like we told you after the Pokhran air crash in January, the buck actually stops with the government of Nepal. It simply has not been doing its job because otherwise the basic checks would have been in place. Following the Air India close shave, Nepal's Civil Aviation Authority has formed a three-member probe committee. They are supposed to investigate the matter. But what after that? You see, there is a plane crash in Nepal almost every year. And every time there is an air disaster, Nepal wastes no time in ordering a probe. But what happens after that? Are the recommendations of any of the reports even implemented? I hardly doubt that because when we went through the air crash reports earlier this year, most of them pointed at similar errors, similar gaps in the system. And most of them were very basic things that are hard to get wrong, like coordination among the crew or pre-flight briefings. What happened last Friday with the Air India flight proved that point yet again that the government of Nepal is not doing its bit to ensure that the basic safety protocols are in place, that the people deployed in the country's aviation sector have the basic training, like how to fly a plane or how to control the air traffic, how to ensure that a flight approaching your airport does not crash or gets hit by another plane. As I speak, Nepal does not have the basics in place. And the result is... Nepal is fast becoming the most dangerous fly zone in the world. European countries have already banned Nepal's airlines from flying into the continent. It's a matter of time before countries mull suspending flights into Nepal. What about you? What does this piece of report mean to you? If you are planning to travel to Nepal, you should blink and sink. Take the road if you must go, because flying to Nepal or in Nepal is a big no-no. And our next story comes from West Asia. Earlier this month, Saudi Arabia and Iran agreed to revive relations after years of hostility. We have been telling you about this and how it is a turning point for the region. And now there is a crucial meeting on the horizon. The foreign ministers of the two countries will be meeting during the holy month of Ramzan. What's in store? How will this meeting change the dynamics? Our next report getting you the complete story. The foreign ministers of Shia majority Iran and Sunni Muslim Saudi Arabia spoke over the phone for the second time in a few days, according to the Saudi state news agency SPA. A number of issues were discussed during the call in light of the reconciliation deal which was brokered by China. 
The agency says Saudi Foreign Minister Prince Faisal bin Farhan al Saud and his Iranian counterpart Hussein Amir Abdullahian have agreed to hold a bilateral meeting during the ongoing Muslim holy month of Ramzan. Ramzan is likely to end on April 20th. The deal was the result of previously undisclosed talks in Beijing between Iranian and Saudi security officials. It reflected China's desire to play peacemaker in West Asia. The two countries agreed to revive relations after years of hostility. What will this reconciliation deal mean for the two sides? The expectation is that it will help build stronger security and economic cooperation between Riyadh and Tehran. The deal expects to see the two countries reopen their embassies and missions. The two sides hope the deal will benefit them. As Iran seeks to undercut America's efforts to isolate the nation. And Saudi Arabia tries to focus on its economic development. The years of hostility between the two sides threatened stability and security in the Gulf and helped fuel conflicts in West Asia, from Yemen to Syria. The feud between the powerful neighbors has been fueled by religious differences and the fierce struggle for regional dominance. Saudi Arabia cut ties with Iran in 2016. This was after its embassy in Tehran was stormed during a dispute between the two countries over Riyadh's execution of a Shiite Muslim cleric. Riyadh also accused Tehran of conducting attacks on its oil facilities in 2019. It also blamed Iran for attacks on tankers in Gulf waters. Iran rejected the allegations. Yemen's Iran-aligned Houthi movement has also carried out cross-border missile attacks into Saudi Arabia, now that the two arch-rivals have agreed to put their differences aside after seven years of estrangement. The move carries implications for the entire region. For Iran's nuclear deal, for the civil war in Yemen, where the two sides are locked in a proxy war. Simply put, it could change the region's geopolitical dynamics. And speaking of Ramzan, here's a question that's buzzing across West Asia. What time is it in Lebanon? And the answer depends on who you ask. The country is Muslims or the country is Christians. And last we checked, they were following two different time zones. Why is that? Well, due to a political dispute. Let me explain this. You see, every year on the last Sunday of March, Lebanon sets its clocks forward by an hour. This marks the end of the winters and the beginning of the summers. And Europe does the same every year. And this aligns Lebanon with the universal time. But last Thursday, Lebanon's government refused to do so. It pushed the start of daylight savings to the 21st of April. And the question is, why? The answer is uncertain. No reason has been given for the decision. However, a video is going viral online. It shows Lebanon's prime minister in conversation with the country's speaker. In this video, the speaker is seen asking McCarthy to postpone the implementation of daylight savings. And why is that? to allow Muslims to break their fast during Ramzan an hour earlier. As it turns out, the Prime Minister has accepted that proposal, probably because he himself is a Sunni Muslim. After all, why would he want to upset his voters? But you see, his decision has upset the country's Christian politicians. I'll tell you how in just a bit. First, you must have a look at this graph. It shows you Lebanon's demographics. Around 61% of the people in the country are Muslims, both Sunni and Shia. Over 33.7% follow Christianity. They are mostly Maronite and Catholics. And 5.7% of the people are Druze, an ethno-religious group. So it's a diverse country and because of this, it has a multi-congressional governance system. A power-sharing arrangement between people of different faiths. And under this system, the president must always be a Maronite Christian. 
the Prime Minister must always be a Sunni Muslim and the Speaker of the Parliament must be a Shia Muslim. This system was once praised as a pillar of coexistence. But today it seems to have divided the country, courtesy the Prime Minister's decision to not change the daylight savings time. It has led to a split, a split between the Muslims and the Christians. The Maronite Church has rejected the postponement. Many private Christian organizations have done the same. In fact, some TV channels, schools and businesses have followed suit. So because of this split, Lebanon has ended up with two time zones, a Muslim time zone and a Christian time zone. This has obviously led to confusion. The people say this confusion is emblematic of the religious tensions that prevailed in the country back in the 80s. Let's listen in to some voices. My watch here shows 12 p.m. at the old time. When someone asks me if I want to follow the new timing, I should say 1 p.m. But the best thing to do for me not to get lost. I will wear a watch on the right hand following the new time and another watch on the left hand keeping the old time. So I tell you, whoever asks me to pick which one they want, the new or the old. We were at a house party last night and we looked at our phones. One phone showed the clock as 1.20 a.m. and the other one showed it as 2.20 a.m. We were wondering what was happening, so we took a photo of both the phones to double check later. I have no problem telling you what time it is, but according to which timing? That of Christians or Muslims? Which one? According to Muslims' timing, now it's 14.08. But for Christians, it's 15.08. How do you feel about this country where there are two different timings? And this chaos is striking, especially given the timing of it. Lebanon is reeling from an economic crisis for the last two years now. Ever since the Beirut blast, the country's finances have been in disarray. The government is struggling to pay debts. The people keep running out of money. And at a time like this, this time zone mess is further sowing disorientation in this Mediterranean country. What is the government trying to do? Why is it trying to divide the people further? Last we checked, the Prime Minister says that that was not his intention, that the decision was purely administrative in nature. Listen to this. The aim of this decision was to relieve those who are fasting during Ramzan for an hour without causing any harm to any other Lebanese component and knowing that such a decision has been taken before in the past. Suddenly, outside the purely natural and administrative context, some considered the decision a challenge to them and gave it a dimension that I had never imagined. But I absolutely did not take this decision for sectarian or religious reasons. So what happens next? Well, the Lebanese people will have to wait until next month to have a common time zone. And until then, they will have to keep looking at each other's watches. Our next story comes from South Africa. This is the story of an influential diplomat, or let's say a controversial diplomat. Hubert Angel, one of Zimbabwe's well-known diplomats. He has used his status to launder millions of dollars through a gold smuggling scheme. This must have spiked your curiosity. What made a country's ambassador turn into a gold smuggler? Al Jazeera's investigative unit found that Angel, who claims to be a prophet, developed a scheme which would allow unaccounted cash to be exchanged for gold in Zimbabwe. Recipients of the gold can later sell the precious metal for legitimate money. And this would turn their cash into clean money. And this case gets even more interesting. The diplomat turned gold smuggler had the approval of the president of Zimbabwe, Emerson Nangagwa. This is the president who appointed Angel as the presidential envoy. This actually helped Angel use his diplomatic status to carry large volumes of dirty cash into the country. But carrying out illicit trade in such high volumes would make any man nervous. But not Hubert Angel. You want gold? 
I can make a call right now and it will be done. This is what he said to the news outlet and emphasize that no one is allowed to touch the gold without his permission. This man runs a tight ship and clearly believes that he is untouchable. And the role of the president goes deeper into this whole scam. His own niece, Henrietta Rushwaya, was yet another accomplice. She came out as a big player in this smuggling business when she said that smuggling 100 kgs of gold every week would be of no problem for her. Let's just have a look at how the gold smuggling scheme really works. A person has to make an initial investment of $10 million into the government's gold refinery called Fidelity. $5 million from that amount would be held by Fidelity, while rest of the cash is used to buy gold every week. And once the gold is purchased, the leftover $5 million is brought in to buy more gold. And this process would continue until all the money is laundered into the precious metal, which would then be sold internationally for clean cash. Such an elaborate scheme was used in a country which faces a number of Western sanctions. But people like Angel, who use their diplomatic clout, used a complex web of companies and bribes to make the country into a smuggling hub. But how is it possible amid the tons of sanctions? Well, in the case of the gold mafia, where there is a will, there is a way, it seems. Although the government is blocked with international sanctions which make gold exports close to impossible, smugglers have found a way out to use individual gold miners who do not face those restrictions. And this way Zimbabwe became a fertile ground for money launderers who are helping the country earn in dollars. This comes when Zimbabwe is in dire need of dollars. Especially at this time when their own currency has lost its value due to hyperinflation. This makes a commodity like gold the best way to earn in dollars. But the smugglers' greed for dollars has put Zimbabwe at a major loss. Although the country has got world-class deposits of gold, it has nothing to show for it. And that is because the country has lost billions of dollars in illegal gold exports. Officials say that the biggest challenge Zimbabwe now faces is the existential threat posed by the gold mafia. A look into the gold smuggling circuit comprising of Zimbabwe's president, his family and a presidential envoy seems to be the recipe for disaster. Will the country's gold mafia continue to star starve the country of its own gold? We'll have to wait and watch. And since it's Monday, how can I not talk about Monday blues? We've all dealt with them. We've also tackled or tried our best to tackle what precedes those Monday blues. You know what I'm talking about. Those jitters on Sunday evening, also called Sunday scaries. Basically, the anxiety felt right before you head into a working week. And since it's the start of a brand new week, you want to try and fix what you failed to do the previous week, perhaps, or over the past few weeks. You make long to-do lists for the first day of the week, hoping to be extremely productive. Maybe your list has some leftover tasks from the previous week, or fresh tasks that you want to get done with right at the beginning of the week. You take it as a fresh start. You want to up your game. You know what they say about new beginnings, right? Be it a new year or a new week, the pressure to do your best and be super productive is real. You want to start right, and which is why Mondays mean stress. But what if you take it easy at the beginning of the week? What if you do the bare minimum on Mondays? This term was popularized by TikToker Marisa Jo Maez. According to her, she had a hustle culture problem, also a perfectionism problem. This was resulting in stress, it was causing burnout. So she tried something different. To do only what needs to be done. To get through the day. And that is what bare minimum Mondays are all about. Basically, it's all about self-care. 
taking it easy when you start the week it's also a part of the slow work movement basically the opposite of hustle culture focusing on the important tasks and getting them out of the way you could begin your monday by starting slow doing what makes you feel good for the first couple of hours staying away from technology and then completing your key work tasks trying to keep your day short you could start the day late after a morning of self care activities simply put you cut yourself some slack you ease the pressure but all said and done we do understand that this approach is not for everyone not everyone has the option of having a bare minimum monday it's not realistic for everyone but you could probably adopt some of these practices it's all about prioritizing yourself after all in whatever way works for you what do you think about this work concept would it work for you are you thinking of giving it a shot or do you already practice it been there done that and did not quite work out for you write to us and let us know and with that it's a wrap on this edition of gravitas leaving you with gravitas images thanks very much for watching